Hi there. Um, I think we'll get started now. It's five o'clock on the dot. Um, you know, in virtual time, it seems like you may as well begin on time and folks will filter in as we get started. I wanna thank you for joining us tonight for a great conversation between the artists Maria Magdalena Campos Ponce and Jeffrey Gibson. It's sponsored by the Greenberg Steinhauser Forum in American Portraiture, our new conversation series um, that we've just launched recently. I'm Gwendolyn Du Bois Shaw. I'm the senior historian here at the National Portrait Gallery, which you see behind me, our COVID courtyard, um, which hopefully will reopen um, in several weeks. Um, in addition to being the senior historian, I'm also the director of Portal, the Portrait Gallery's scholarly center. Because we will be showing images um, tonight as a part of the presentation, we recommend that you select the gallery active speaker or thumbnail view, um, which should give you uh, enough screen space to see the panelists, um, the images and the video that we'll be sharing with you. We also have closed captioning available. Um, live closed captioning can be accessed along the bottom menu. As, as can the question and answer function um, into which you are welcome to submit questions for our speakers. Before beginning, I'd also like to invite you to join us again on Tuesday, August 4th at 5 p.m. here on Zoom for the Tommy L. Pegues and Donald A. Capocha conversation series on LGBTQ plus portraiture. This will be the second installment um, in this series and it will feature uh, the Smithsonian Secretary Lonnie G. Bunch III and former Smithsonian Regent uh, John W. McCarter Jr. who will be in a discussion about the legacy of the censorship of a video by David Wonorovich uh, that was in the National Portrait Gallery's 2010 exhibition, Hide Seek, Difference and Desire in American Portraiture. With tonight's program, we begin a series of conversations on artistic strategies for reinserting Black, Indigenous, and people of color histories into museum spaces through live performance and object creation. This series will continue later this summer when we welcome artists Wanda Raimondi Ortiz and Genevieve Gagnard to our Zoom webinar forum on Tuesday, August 18th uh, at 5 p.m. Tonight, we're very pleased that National Portrait Gallery's own curator of painting and sculpture, Dorothy Moss, will be moderating the conversation. In 2015, Dorothy initiated the Portrait Gallery's first performance art series, Identify, which has included 10 different commissioned performances by internationally recognized artists, including today's guests. Dorothy's past exhibitions include directing the 2013, 2016, and 2019 Out One Bucci of her portrait competition and exhibitions, The Sweat of Their Faces, Portrayals of American Workers, which she co-curated with David Ward, and One Life, Sylvia Plath. Her upcoming exhibitions include Hung Lu, Portraits of Promised Lands, which will open next spring of 2021 um, with a catalog published by Yale University Press and One Life, Maya Lin, which is scheduled for 2022. She is also on the team of curators who are putting together an amazing contemporary portraiture exhibition called Kinship, which will open in 2022. Please help me in welcoming Dorothy. Thank you so much, Gwendolyn. Um, it is such a pr pleasure and a privilege to work with you. Um, through the Greenberg Steinhauser Forum in American Portraiture uh, during this challenging time um, to bring artists and scholars' voices into a conversation around how to build a more just society. And I am absolutely thrilled and honored to be in conversation tonight with Maria Magdalena Campos Pons and Jeffrey Gibson, who created new performances for the National Portrait Gallery's Identify portrait series. Uh, it's our, our first performance art series where we ask artists to consider the history of our museum. The National Portrait Gallery is the third oldest museum, the third oldest building, federal building in Washington. And it is um, such a historic space. We want to honor the people who stories have not been heard or told in the building, the people who built our museum building, those who did not have access to portraiture. And I initiated a performance art series in order to address absence in our collection. 
um, and to bring the story of those who have felt marginalized in our nation's museums to light. And Jeffrey Gibson and Maria Magdalena Campos Pons created transformative performances for us um, using sound, uh, using volunteers and, and participants who brought poetry into the building, who brought their uh, stories to light for us, um, and who truly you know, made our, our space one that is welcome and accessible and that tells the story of everyone who comes through our doors. So I'm delighted to be with them tonight. Maria Magdalena Campos Pons was born in 1959 in the province of Montanzas in the town of La Vega, Cuba. She grew up on a sugar plantation in a family with Nigerian, Hispanic, and Chinese roots. Her Nigerian ancestors were brought to Cuba as slaves in the 19th century and passed on traditions, rituals, and beliefs. Her polyglot heritage profoundly influences her artistic practice, which combines diverse media, including photography, performance, painting, sculpture, film, and video. Her work is autobiographical, investigating themes of history, memory, gender and religion and how they form identity. Through deeply poetic and haunting imagery, Campos Pons evokes the stories of the transatlantic slave trade, indigo and sugar plantations, Catholic and Santeria religious practices and revolutionary uprisings. She's had a number of solo exhibitions in major museums, including the Museum of Modern Art in New York, the Indianapolis Museum of Art, the Peabody Essex Museum, the National Gallery of Canada, among other distinguished institutions. And uh, she is now Cornelius Vanderbilt Chair at the Vanderbilt University in Nashville, Tennessee. Jeffrey Gibson is an interdisciplinary artist working in Hudson, New York. His artworks make reference to various aesthetic and material histories rooted in indigenous cultures of the Americas and in modern and contemporary subcultures. Selected solo exhibitions include Like a Hammer, organized by the Denver Art Museum, This is the Day, organized by the Wellen Museum, The Anthropophagic Effect at the New Museum in New York City, and Look How Far We've Come at the Haggerty Museum in Milwaukee. Select group exhibitions include the 2019 Whitney Biennial, Suffering from Realness at Mass Mocha, and Art for a New Understanding at Crystal Bridges. Gibson is also a faculty member at Bard College. He was the 2019 recipient of a MacArthur Foundation Fellowship. Please join me in welcoming them. Um, to get started, I wanted to say a couple of things about the thread that I see running through the two performances that were commissioned for our Identify series. And here on the screen, you see the, the description of the series. Identify pulls back the curtain of time to acknowledge those who are missing from the museum's historical collections. Wealth, class, race, and gender often determine who could have a portrait made in the 18th and 19th century. This performance art series strives to make visible the invisible. Each artist selected, and we've had 10 commission portra portraits in this series, critiques American portraiture and institutional history by making visible a body or bodies that have historically been forgotten. Uh, both artists um, were asked to come for site visits and to think about how to use their vision to transform our spaces. And uh, in both performances, the artists use sound to, I think, a really profound effect. And I want to talk about that when we get into our conversation. They were also very deliberate in choosing participants um, and putting out a call for people in our community around the museum to be a part of the work with them. In the case of Maria Magdalena Campos Pond, she specifically went to the Duke Ellington School of the Arts to work with drama students, as well as students who are in the uh, music program there to conceptualize the, the vision that she had started conjuring with the students. So they would feel ownership of the work and, and be really um, a part of the museum in a way that many of them had never 
felt. Um, they, a lot of their families had never been in the museum, so this was an important moment for the students. Um, Maria Magdalena Cabos Pons also included poet Monifa Love and some performers who have followed her over time and in performances, including Del Hamilton and Helena Metaferia. Jeffrey asked for uh, participants who are indigenous and or from the LBGTQI plus communities. Uh, we put out a call in the area through universities and other organizations. We actually had so many people respond to the call um, that we had more participants than we expected. And, and that's a really beautiful thing about this. I know many of the perform, per, participants who were in both performances are on this um, event tonight. And I want to welcome you all um, especially. So. Now we are going to um, play the uh, video clips of each performance. Magda, I would like to ask you to begin by just giving us an overview of your concept for the performance, which was titled Identify and uh, took place at the National Portrait Gallery on May 14th, 2016. Dorothy and uh, Jeffrey and Gwendolyn, uh, Jacqueline and our audience, I want to say hello to everybody and how wonderful it is to be with all you together this afternoon in this particular time. Uh, I choose the title uh, almost as a redundant to the, the title of the series. I found that the idea of call it identify was an important uh, move toward the idea of giving agency to voices that have been in the side. But I saw too that the soldierhood that we wanted to address was the accent of the black body within the wall of the museum, in that particular museum, uh, it had been an issue that already has been identified. So that is why I choose to call the piece Identify It. And for me, that question started very young. When I was 13 years old and I went to the first museum of fine art in Havana, the National Museum of Fine Art, I identified at that moment the accent of black faces and the accents of people of brown, and darker tones. So it, in my case for the museum was a, the, the, the spring of, of 2016 was already the moment where I called the carnage that we have been witnessing for a number of years in America with the constant dropping of black bodies to the ground by brutality or in that case police brutality. So I, I wanted to bring a great group of uh, black bodies into the museum and mark the fact that the National Portrait Gallery was a very important historical uh, institution for uh, Washington DC and for the history of America. And what I focused was in three aspects of the history of that museum. The fact there was a patent building, the fact there was a hospital during the Civil War, and then that become a museum itself. So I tried to take aspect of that history and build with that a trajectory of how I was seeing the presence of the black body through it. Uh, I used the, the form of a procession who is significant for the history both of a, a black Cuban and also a Creole Cuban because it had not only an African um, a heritage but also an Spanish one. And the fact that the procession is a way to narrate to time and through a space. So knowing that the museum, and I forgot to mention, there was the second inauguration of Abraham Lincoln took place in the third floor. I wanted to literally construct a narrative of a space in which we were telling a little bit of the history of the past, but the history of the present. Three figures that were important during different moments of historical uh, development in the museum come to my mind. Clara Barton who was a, a clerk in the Patent Building. Uh, Watt Whitman, who was a nurse during the Civil War, but he was a poet at the same time. Uh, as part of uh, individuals that were, that were uh, important uh, in the history of America, Clara Barton ended a uh, developing the Red Cross. So it was an important figure for the aspect of healing and health uh, for this country. And of course, uh, what women present as a poet was extraordinary. So I, I structure and the presence of the Abraham Lincoln 
in his second inauguration in the third floor, in which he invited for the first time the citizenship of uh, Washington, D.C., to accompany him in an important dinner that took place there. But I was thinking too that what I was trying to trace was among those different transition of his history and events, how was Mark Onof the president of the black body? Uh, I knew and I learned from researching in the building that it was built by labor, uh, uh, labor, uh, slave labor. So it was clear to me that that building that we were standing uh, that time was a building that was built up by the sweat of descendants of African and a slave in this case, they were bringing to America. Uh, in, the history, in the history of portraiture, it's a consistent accent of the body because portraiture per se was a form to reinforce a power, uh, elites, and access to power. And the history of the black body was the history of dispossession and an abandonment and erasure. So it was very important for this uh, performance to structure a way in which we narrated through the building uh, in a way that I would say attending to cardinal points, which is a fundamental structure at the building itself. It's a building that look in, in the direction north, south, east, west, and the principal salon of the building are looking through a structure through this very Masonic um, uh, disposition of architecture. So I, I was thinking of that too, in the way that in Yoruba tradition, uh, which is important to mention the dress that this lady is wearing, we celebrate the presence of the ancestor energy. So that performance identified was fundamental, a reaffirmation of ancestral energy that never left the building. It was a source of celebration or return to the labor, to the effort, to the sweat, to unpaid hours of love and, the, and dedication the black bodies placed to build this building to the perfection and the quality that it has. Uh, it was, so I was, I was structuring uh, both the image of the masquerade figure, which is a goon in celebration of the ancestor to structure the, the path, the narration of all the other history that I wanted to introduce in the, in the counting and mention uh, the bodies that were dropping, black bodies, and they're inserting the narrative of the poet, what Whitman by Monifa Law, the narrative of the citizenship by uh, Helena Metaphilia in a conversation with Washington, and the image of the citizen by Del Hamilton in a conversation with Abraham Lincoln in the second floor in front of their portraits. And two important scenes, the masquerade figure is always accompanied by a young figure. And she is an image of an owl. And the owl for me was a wisdom and the potentiality of the future that the black body always knew that it was there. And it was almost like this guarding force to keep going and to sustain energy to the darkest moment. So Nora Finley, which is the smaller of the participant in the performance, is as accessing the different figure and she helped as a narrator of it. I'm going to stop there because I know that we need to keep talking, but it, I think that this is the structure going from first floor to the third floor and I could come back to that what these kids in the floor means and uh, how do we structure that. Thank you, Magda. So Jackie, let's play the clip. So please join me and welcome Lisa. Thank you. Thank you. 
remembered their names. I'll never forget the way that that performance ended with such a powerful call and how relevant it remains today. Jeffrey, I would like to turn to you to introduce your clip now. Um, both of these performances I will mention were about an hour long. So you're just seeing a small portion. Um, whereas Magda took over the museum, she said she was creating, um, she was using the museum as a canvas and creating tableaus within the museum. Jeffrey had a, also a, a, profe a, um, a processional element to his performance, but it took place entirely in the Kogod courtyard of the museum, which if you haven't been to the National Portrait Gallery, there is a beautiful glass canopy over top the museum and it creates incredible acoustics. So Jeffrey, I'll let you jump in to um, introduce the performance before we play the clip. Sure, thank you um, for everyone being here today. Um, I love watching the documentation of Magdalena's performance. Thank you for that. Um, I, um, you know, I think when, we, when I went for a site visit, I was really looking for one place that could contain everything um, and I think it started with a vision of a group of people. In my background, uh, both of my grandfathers founded um, Indian Southern Baptist churches, um, both in Mississippi and Oklahoma. So I think for me trying to um, reconcile kind of a, a romantic love of the South um, and the church from a distance because they also frightened me tremendously um, so as an image, this idea of a choir is something that um, I knew was part of the image that I wanted to create and also the gowns that everyone is wearing. Um, you know, I was doing another performance also in DC at Georgetown University um, earlier that year after Dorothy had invited me to, to think about a performance for National Portrait Gallery. And um, it was actually the day of uh, Dr. Christine Blasey Ford giving testimony during the Kavanaugh hearings. And um, it was when it was announced that um, really, you know, it, it didn't accomplish what we had hoped her testimony would accomplish. And I remember feeling really disheartened that evening. 
um, to the point of maybe considering canceling the performance that I was getting ready to do. And, you know, I can think back to a number of um, times during the past, you know, five or six years where these kind of uh, cultural kind of disappointments and sadness have been very present. And I think a lot of artists wondering, you know, what, what can we do? What do we do in times like this? And, um, but that, that evening, I remember the words just came to me, um, she speaks up to take them down. And that was the very beginning of the, the, the um, authoring of these 50 phrases. And I thought about, you know, those words are about naming what someone has done, whether it's an accomplishment or what somebody, circumstances that somebody's in. And I started thinking about that as a way of naming other people and also really in an effort to, to find inspiration and to find hope in what other people were doing and where was I going to find that. And, um, and I think also in this is a memory of, you know, I grew up in Southern Maryland during my high school years and went to um, an LGBTQ club in near the, the barracks, I believe, the, the, it was called Tracks. this was in the 90s. But that period of time of the late 80s and early 90s really did feel like the future was so inclusive, like the future that we were heading to was, um, you know, these, these challenges of gender or of equity seemed like they were going to fade into the past and we were going to become more evolved and more progressive. And so I wanted to assemble like-minded people um, who I think don't see identifying as other, as divisive, you know, but rather we become a greater sum of parts by um, offering our, you know, possibly even nuanced whole persons to a community and bringing to the table what we do best. Um, and so, um, so yeah, so that's where the call comes from. I think, you know, it's also just letting people self-identify, which is something that I think is really important. Um, it's something that this idea of allowing somebody to self-identify and to not question it, you know, it's not about like, are you black enough? Are you native enough? But let's um, let people self-identify. And I was surprised at how many people arrived. I, I really wanted to um, think about the performance as a procession and use sound as a way to both overcome the individual body and the collective body, because I think the drumming, when it, uh, especially in the acoustics of this space, you know, you really feel it in your body. And also it's cathartic for the people who are doing the drumming to allow them to really bang on this drum as hard as they can, and also to move together in timing, um, you know, soft drumming, hard drumming, and as they're walking. And to really like kind of uh, lose both your individuality into the collective and feel empowered by the collective as it builds from one performer to 50. So, um, and I think um, in relationship to, to Magda's work, you know, the, the idea of names is something that has always been with me, but calling out the names of people um, is something that I think is powerful in, in honor of your ancestors and also calling upon strength and um, memory and kind of pulling together time. It's sort of like um, calling upon ancestors of the past to be present with you so that you are empowered and stronger to kind of initiate a future is the way that I think about calling names. And um, so the performers would walk up to the center of the bleachers. They would call out their name. They would continue drumming and step back onto the bleachers. And then once all 50 were um, assembled on the bleachers, then I began calling them off one by one. Um, and really, it, I think it was very simple. Um, I wanted something, um, I think, with performances that I hope can be re-performed in different iterations in different places with different communities. So we've had the chance to um, do this performance at least two other times and possibly a third time coming up. And it's been interesting, the people who come in. But I feel like when we only give ourselves you know, one day that we meet, we kind of assemble, we organize, and then we perform, 
it, um, I don't know, it makes it a very powerful day that's both exhausting and exhilarating. And I've been really impressed that the performers seem to get just as much out of it as I do in terms of just being able to try to be as generous as I can in giving them space to be loud, giving them space to shout, giving them space to whisper, to breathe, to perform, to be looked at, um, which I think for many people who are there, the shyness factor of being in front of a large group of people and being spotlighted can be really frightening. But when you're in a community and you feel like you're doing it for purpose, it feels like somehow that that spotlight is somehow diffused onto a larger cause or community. So, yeah, I, I am, you know, I, I do everything as a kind of experiment, but I will say this was um, much more successful than I would have imagined. And every time we've performed it, the spaces have been very different and it's been able to accommodate many different spaces, but it's really been the reactions of the volunteers and the performers that has been the most impactful part of it. And um, also with the garments and the drums, I feel like, you know, as an artist to make an object um, and then to have that object exist without, without having been charged in some sort of use um, is just an object, you know, has yet to be activated. So I think the fact that these drums have been handled and shipped and moved around and the garments have been worn by numerous people and, um, they begin to take on a history and a meaning, which I think is significant to the object going forward in terms of how they are. But I'll stop there. Skin brings light. She protects the land. She growls like a lion. So Mag, I wanted to give you a chance to respond to Jeffrey's performance since he could respond to yours. Oh, you're on mute. <laughs> I was so entranced at just looking at the documentation. Uh, I think that we, that is wonderful. It was wonderful to hear you, Jeffrey, contextualize in the idea from the individual to the collective and this power of the many voices, because this is true as well for my investigation. And in, 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 the, in the case of the sound, in my case, we have two different group of three orchestra in that space. We have in the bottom, in the, in the yard, in the courtyard, a, a, a jazz band that include luminaries such as Terry Blanchard, uh, Neil Leonard, who is the one that put the sound together, Oriente Lopez, a fantastic Cuban musician, Sandy Perez. In the, in the, in the, third, floor, in the third floor, in the staircase, we have an only brass band 
of students from the Duke and Ellington School. And literally what we were thinking was in the architecture of the staircase. And we were thinking in the fact that the architecture of the building in some way mimic the structure of the French horn of any of the brass instruments. So this was so important for the acoustic, of, of using of the acoustic of this space. And in the third floor, we have a Cuban band, but in the traditional uh, Santeria, Yoruba uh, tradition. So it was these three different layers of sound that is going to create different atmosphere and different sonic experience to the building. One important scene that I believe that, it, that was significant in this piece, a different of your work, I don't think that I could repeat identified in any other space because it's a piece that born out of understanding and interpreting and talking back to the, the history and the structure of this particular building. So if, when, when, the, when the goon go to the third floor and stand in the center of the building, kind of circling around uh, like, a, like in a spirit, uh, it was because we are in the center of a structure of a very classic, a dominant uh, architectonic and symbolic too in the crossroad and in the crossroad that is important for Egun and for Elewa in Yoruba, but it's important too for the power of masonry that is in the center of the political power and history of Washington, D.C. And we were trying to, to just oppose these two layers of information. Uh, it was very, very important, as you say, and I feel exactly like you, uh, working with the student from the, uh, the Duke Ellington School, not only that for the first time in the history of uh, their own education, their family, many of their family were coming to the National Portrait Gallery for the first time. As an artist, for me, this is a dream. This is really the consequential uh, uh, st staging of the idea of bringing community and creating, join and creating links of relation between institutional frame of ideas and the people. Uh, furthermore, I was trying to convey and to contest him back to this history of the inauguration in which Lincoln called the people. So for me in 2016, bringing especially black family all those kids were the kids of black family. So this is a very important um, um, taking, taking a, again a agency and giving back to this history in which we only have seen the body in his separation from the place that it, in, it started and it helped to the creation of what it is itself as a building, that was very important. They were students there who I still in touch. Some of them that wanted to, they, I know that they would end up coming to a story to either uh, Berkeley College of Music or the Museum School of Vanderbilt because that was an inspiration and an important uh, uh, an event. And the fact that I, I was mentioned to, to, to the students there, and I mentioned to my students at Vanderbilt at the Museum School at the time, uh, when you make a site a specific of what I say myself in my own term, a situ acted performance, when you bring meaning from the place and the performance they, 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 uh, place, you are really uh, doing something similar to what I say the dogs when they pee in the corner of the, of the, of the block. Forever, they mark that corner and they will remember the spot because the smell of the urine. So in some way, uh, anybody that visit the, the National Porte Gallery in this performance day, forever, they would have within the image of what took place there. There were scenes, again, that um, when I assume the building, I always say, and, and I um, quote uh, in some way here, uh, you know, the site have meaning, the site itself is a con content per se. So for me, in this particular courtyard, when it's this flat uh, fountain, I couldn't take away from me that the transatlantic journey was in the belly of a vessel and that this courtyard looked like the hull of a sheet and that it was bottom, water in the bottom. So that is what I decided. I'm going to enact in that space the, the dropping of the body, these bodies that are dropping at the, at, the, at the sound 
of a, of a, of a shot. And, but also these bodies, they have been marked with sugar powder. So the silhouette of the bodies in the ground after terrible events, death, etc. now were enacted with sugar. That culprit, that terrible uh, uh, material and fundamental who create so much trouble and so much pain for the history of the brown and black body in the Americas. So I was trying to create historical links as well. The Lincoln itself uh, was talking about, you know, the connection the, with the with the end of his slavery, but also he was thinking of the Caribbean and Latin America as a place in which those other problems could be sent on. So then Hamilton take on this in her conversation with Lincoln and kind of contesting him back about his interpretation of his reading of history and the reading of the Caribbean, where I come from, with the Hamilton come from, when the sugar industry who was so important in the moment that this building is constructed in Washington DC as a, as a the backyard of all the, of all the troubles and of, that are happening in the, in the America, the continental place. And also creating what I believe too in the idea of the procession, a procession link places, a procession link narrative, a procession link uh, stories. A procession is too a linkage of time. No, so that right. was your, Magda, your your performance through the procession linked spaces in the building that I think our curators and staff had not necessarily associated with each other before. So in that way, your your movement through the building with the sound transformed our spaces, made us see differently. I could still smell the sugar on the ground surrounding the bodies. And Jeffrey, with your performance, I can still almost feel the way you transformed our heartbeat through the drums together. And I am reminded of what Magda was saying about the um, empowering the students, giving the students a place to um, have a voice and, and your um, discussion of empowering your participants to speak up or to whisper, to be who they are in our space. Um, and how new that was for some of them. And I, I remember after the um, performance, Jeffrey, we had a dialogue with the participants. And one of the participants said, I have never looked at this museum and felt I had any reason to be there. I've never come into these, these spaces. I've never wanted to, but now I'll keep returning, which is a really powerful moment. Yeah, I think for me, um, I really focused, uh, it happened, you know, that was the first time it was performed and it happened that day, but really focused on the performers. And um, because so much of it is about, about them trusting me and trusting the process. And I think, you know, I, it, it's sort of like um, allowing people in the audience to just sort of witness and watch um, a community form so quickly and you know, people had real emotional experiences just trying to speak, just trying to say something loudly and they got to choose their names and many people chose them for very personal reasons. So I think it was also something that I've just struggled with during my life, but this idea of finding your voice and not being afraid to use it and to speak up is something that I think generally, I know in, in, in people of color who I talk to we all have experienced at different times and, and have felt it relative to being a person of color. I'm seeing some questions come in in the form of raised hands. If you could type your questions into the Q&A, I will share your questions um, with Magda and Jeffrey. Um, I just wanted to speak uh, momentarily about um, logistics of putting on these kinds of performances in a uh, federal museum. Um, it's not easy to do this kind of work with the challenges that um, we, we face in terms of bureaucracy. Uh, I, I'll never forget an art historian asked me if it's hard to get contemporary artists who interrupt museum spaces to sign a federal contract. Um, it's not hard, but what is wonderful to watch and so meaningful about this kind of work is watching artists be creative within the limitations uh, that are presented. 
So in Magda's case, the sugar that um, she outlined the bodies, that was a, a decision she made at the last minute because she wasn't allowed to use chalk on the water scrims. Uh, so she added sugar, which in the end was almost more powerful than the chalk because it added that sensory um, component of smell and scent and relates to Cuba. Um, and it was just a beautiful way of problem solving. Um, and, and Jeffrey, I know um, in your case, you only had a day to meet with the participants to rehearse one time. You, you mentioned some of them were very um, nervous. And, um, and, and we're scared that they might not be able to do the drumming in sync, but you reassured them, you got them all on board. And um, in both cases, the joy, just the sheer joy that we all witnessed as the participants came together to celebrate having been part of these performances was so uplifting. Um, it's a reason for museums to keep doing this work and the joy of the audiences. Um, you walk away feeling like you've really been in a communal experience um, that is, is unlike most of our daily experiences, especially now in our isolation, but even before you know, this period in time, um, that kind of connection in museum spaces um, is, can, can, is very powerful um, and it's not always there. I have a question that has come through. Um, artists have been protesting for representation since the 1960s. Uh, both of you have been doing work for decades about institutional critique regarding museums' white supremacy. Why is it that museums are only taking action in the past five years regarding inequality and lack of representation? What do you, Magda and Jeffrey, think about this shift? Well. Uh, um, that is such a good question, and that is such a good observation. Um, uh, I think in that, uh, for once, the museums uh, could not sustain forever the politic of what I say, maybe of exclusion and erasure of narratives that are important. And I believe that the art they have been produced by um, brown, indigenous, black, uh, all the other people has is a fundamental important. I think they had been uh, both in academic grounds and in museum practice and in artists uh, studio itself, a very deep conversation, important conversations about uh, uh, equality, not only or access, not only in what art is represented, but also who are the how what is the body of the institutional. Um, uh, individual who made the decision. So I believe that in the last few years, we have seen a numerous uh, improvement in the present, in the representation and participation of uh, curators, directors of other people of brown, black, uh, into the into the position of power. I, I need to say too that uh, then you have a, 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 what Dorothy have done in the National Portrait Gallery was so fantastic and so important. And in some ways, so so revolutionary because it was not only the inclusion of, of forgetting voices, but it was a, a kind of mining to to come back to Fred Wilson. It was a mining of the museum from within. It was a gesture of solidarity and a, and a gesture of uh, awareness that uh, there was a, a history, institu institutional history of the museum per se that needed to be reconsidered and reviewed and open for, for inquiry and for investigation. I think that we are in a moment of transition and is no way to look back. I think that is a moment of recognition that yes, uh, modernity or postmodernity or whatever ism that we're going to use has more than one skin color tone in how it's writing, how it's a structure and how it's archived. And that the history of fortitude is to give access and permanency of faces and stories within institutional frame so uh, I, I hope, uh, and that is my hope, and I take personally a great pride and great responsibility. Uh, when I bring my students to perform for me, I am inserting a, a, a further protest. I am not just bringing my body and myself. I am including the bodies and the self and the agency of younger generation of maker for what, for who, I don't want them to wait 10 years 
or 60 years or 40 years in my, or 50 years in my case uh, to have access to certain institution and to certain uh, uh, space of representation. So I think that is a, is a moment of a, 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 a acknowledging, facing and response by the institution, and I, I welcome any, every time that I see a, a new curator of color, of a different representation or whatever that in this whole diverse spectrum that we aspire for, this is very important. And, and it has many ways. I, I would say like uh, Jeffrey said before, there are many ways to, to work in those realms and to expand what is called inclusivity, what is called, you know, in the in bringing in the, the 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 language and the and the conversation of everybody of everybody in inclusive conversation, it couldn't be more poignant. It couldn't be a more auspicious time to reclaim that as today. So I want to use this moment to say I I salute uh, uh, Dorothy for creating this conversation today and allowed us to have this. Uh, 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 expressing of ideas uh, at this particular moment. Thank you, Jeffrey. Did you want to say anything about? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think there's lots of reasons. I think it kind of echoes a lot of what Magda just said. But, um, you know, when I was probably around 35 and I'm 48 now, I remember talking to somebody who was introducing my work to curators and there was an awful lot of no's, like a lot of passes, not interested. And I remember saying to this, uh, this person, I said, you know, what, what's going on? Like, should I just give up? And he said, he said, no, just hang on. He said, the people who are of your generation are right now associate curators, they're fellows, they're not in a position to make this vision reality yet. He was like, just hang on. And then it was like five years later, I started getting calls from people who were roughly my age and said, you know, I've been excited about what you've been doing. I know what you're talking about, about that time, you know, in the 80s, in the 90s. Like, I know this vision. I felt it too. And I'm also disappointed that it's not existing. And so I think, you know, the demographics have changed of museum boards, of funders, of directors and curators and artists. And, um, and I think we're just in the beginning. I mean, I, to me, as an educator, I think the art world is content driven at this point, And we're in such a kind of saturated information, saturated uh, culture that um, this is what's going on. You know, this is what's happening. And if the art world is looking for fuel of content, all of these unwritten histories are sitting there waiting to be articulated, waiting to be given image, um, waiting to be um, shared and conversations. And I think also time, if we're talking about future, we can't, we can't get to the future without establishing a present. And that present is wholly um, situated on understanding what's come before us, you know? So that's where this intergenerational logic comes in. Like, we still have our elders to talk to. We still have our parents. We still have our siblings. And those conversations have to happen. And they are programming. They are programming. It is, it just is what's going on in the world right now. And I think we're really just at the beginning of it. So, um, and the other thing I want to say, which is just a kind of pragmatic thing, but money. You know, there's plenty of people of color who are sitting on boards now who have wealth. And um, I think within the structure of institutions, if you're paying for it, you got to say so in what gets shown. And I think I thank those people so much. Because I think I, it is a very unpopular choice to think that, you know, you're going to work your way onto a museum board. but it is a strategic one that I think people see as absolutely necessary. And I think it's, it's, it's paying us back in dividends as we go forward. So thank you to those people. I echo that. I'm so grateful as a curator to be in a generation of curators who, and I'm Jeffrey, we're the same age. So I am yeah. coming at this moment, um, you know, having grown up in the seventies and early eighties and seeing, um, the world changed. I thought we were in a more hopeful place too when I was in my teens and twenties. Um, and but I also think that the gen the curators of my generation of our generation are activists. Yeah, I didn't yeah. want to do this work to be in an ivory tower. I wanted to do this work to make a real imprint and yeah. working alongside artists like the two of you. Yeah. 
And one thing I didn't know earlier in my career is that those curators who are supporting from me, who are supporting, have been supportive of me, they are advocating for me at every meeting they go to. And I don't mean just me, Jeffrey Gibson. I mean artists who are contributing to this conversation and pushing things forward. And it's not a guaranteed deal. You know, just because the curator has an idea for an amazing show, all of the logistics and concerns that go into like audience and development and programming and what the overall mission of the museum is come into play. So that language has to be established. And right now we're at a point where the push is for that perspective also has to be coming from people of color, about artists of color, about histories of color. So that, you know, there, there's, such a, there's such a rich future for all of this. I think um, it's just wise for institutions to pay attention to. And it, it takes a village. I, I want to take a moment to shout out to Kaia Black, my amazing colleague who worked with me closely on both of your performances and all of the uh, 10 identified performances we've done. I know she's on the call tonight. Um, so it, it's not just curators working in isolation. I mean, it's audience engagement team members. It's the director. Thank, I'm so thankful for Kim Say It because um, this, this program really took off because she supported me and this vision for it and the artist who proposed um, ideas. Um, and I'm grateful to Gwendolyn, who's on now, for making a program like this possible through um, Portal. Uh, and so, you know, I think we all are in this together. We need to work with our board members, um, with the staff. I'm thankful to the security officers of the Portrait Gallery for making the spaces available in the early morning hours and at night for um, the custodial staff, all, all of whom have thanked the artists, um, you know, for, for doing this work. Um, and so it takes a village. Um, I have a question before we start to wrap up um, about where we are right now, given COVID. Um, uh, how do you see performance being transformed in this moment while we are not able to be in the spaces of museums for live performance? Well, Jeffrey, you want to start or me? You go ahead. You go well, ahead. Um, I want to ask you, you too, and everybody in the audience to close your eyes for a second. Or two seconds, or three seconds. Maybe four seconds. Five, six, seven, eight, nine. And open your eyes and remember what you saw. And remember uh, in that moment, I want, I want to, to come so, in some way prescribe this of your own small performance. And if I would ask you to respond, we, would, we are not in a position to that, what do you saw? Uh, you have an answer for that. And what I am thinking is that the performance uh, practice isn't in a space as well of uh, great opportunities and possibilities. I think that this particular moment is, a, I call it a moment of pause. We have been forced to pause. We have been forced to consider silent, to consider a, a no motion. We are, you know, to consider uh, the meaning of time, something so important to performance. Um, and I think that that will result in many different answers uh, to performance. I, for one, I am thinking a lot in the auditory aspect of performance, which is no new in my practice because the sonic element had been there. But I also thinking about the, the, the body itself, the body as a conduit in performance, individual or collective, as a container of sound, as a container of a of sonic space and sonic narrative to be put out and to be built into something. So I am thinking that it's a, it's a good opportunity for performance uh, as we move forward because we are in a transformative, performative moment some way, somehow now. And that we have seen through COVID, uh, through the entire uh, pandemic, how performance becomes so important in different answer to keep the sense of solidarity, to keep the sense of our humanity in motion, no? When we couldn't do anything else, 
people clap from the windows or sing or spoke or some way of somehow performative was present. But because I know that we are almost in the, uh, getting the end of our, of our conversation, I want to come back, Dorothy, very briefly and say that I am still seeing uh, the need and the urgency to open more doors and to open more entry and possibilities to the present of the diversity of narrative and the diversities of history. And that what your museum did with what Gwendolyn, you, uh, Kim, all the Jacqueline, Taya, everybody that is doing is something that I hope that is uh, imitated and taken into account for many other institutions. I see that we are still far from reaching a moment in which we could say that we have a, a, a arrived to, to the equality or even a symmetry uh, in how do we see representation of a, a one set of ideas, one some set of colors and, and representative and versus uh, other. And I am thinking literary uh, narrative that are brown, black, uh, queer, uh, ex all of the above, all of the other uh, possibilities. So I am thinking still that this is a time I see it as a, yes, the future is open and the future is bright, but we are in a time of audience and we are not seeing yet the numbers and the, and the, and the, and the balance. I would say that I need to talk about thinking representation. I say the balance is still tilting to one side of the of the alley. And um, yes, it's a performative moment. I think there is a lot of opportunity for performance. Yeah. I, um, sorry, Dorothy, are you saying something? Sorry. Yes. Last last word goes to you. Oh yeah, I was just gonna say, I think it is a really performative moment because I think performance allows for a lot of things that we can do right now. You know, performance, the idea of live performance, for me is very much about time and responding to the circumstances that we're all in. And if one of the circumstances right now is that we can't, you know, be within certain distance of each other or we can't be on large group gatherings, you know, I, I'm a fan of, you, you know, you acknowledge the circumstances that you're in, whether it's a wall or the floor or the temperature of the room or how sound operates. And I think the biggest element of performance that I embrace is time. You know, it's, it's time and how you can impact the, um, the kind of sensory qualities of the body, you know. And I think we can still do a lot with um, streaming, with sound, with movement. And this has kind of heightened ideas like intimacy and closeness and being in person. There's a kind of charge to having multiple people in a room at this point. So I, I don't see it as, um, you know, the online experience is something which has had to be embraced by every generation due to COVID. And so younger generations who are already having very real relationships and experiences online, I think we have to acknowledge that that is possible. It, it is not the same thing, it's a different kind of relationship, but it is absolutely possible to have a real relationship through image and voice and sound and that it's online. So yeah, we're preparing um, performances right now that will be streamed and we're really just trying to figure out what's the most dynamic experience for a viewer and what, what can you do with, with, with what's available digitally. So. Well, I want to thank you both, Jeffrey and Magda, for your time today. And I want to thank you, Dorothy, for leading us through this really wonderful uh, presentation tonight. Um, to everybody who came, uh, please check your email for our upcoming programs. We'll send you a follow-up email with links uh, where you can register uh, for the upcoming conversations that we'll be having throughout the summer and into um, the autumn. Um, and you can also find a recording of this video in about two or three days on the National Portrait Gallery's YouTube site. So I thank you so much. And I just remind you that portraiture is a very powerful thing and we believe in it at the National Portrait Gallery. So thank you and have a good night. Thank you all. Thank you all.